episode of ET Retail Cafe by ET Retail. We are here to make your Monday mornings interesting with our series ET Retail Cafe, where we have decided to cover 100 retailers and we are really enjoying this journey. I hope you are also. So, just to add a little bit, little bit more spark to it, today we have with us Venu Nair, who is the MD and CEO of Shopperstock. Welcome, Venu, to our show and tell me. How did retail happen to you? Delighted to be here, Charu. Thanks for having me on your show and uh, look forward to a good session uh, this morning. <laughs> uh, retail uh, ha happened over a period of time. I guess my first front end retail happened with Marks and Spencer, uh, that I moved in as the managing director for uh, Marks and Spencer Alliance, which is the joint venture that MS has in India. And, uh, it's been a great journey ever since. Joint shop to stop uh, in November of 2020, just after the first wave of COVID. And over the last, uh, I think it's 12 years of front end retail and the changes that have happened even during that short period has been nothing short of fascinating. So what did you study? Uh, I mean, were you, were you always interested in being a part of the retail industry? Or I mean, what were your aspirations while you were growing? If I'm being honest, I don't think uh, I, I really thought of retail as the end destination when I, when I did my uh, engineering first. I actually worked as an engineer uh, in, in a production, as a production engineer in an aluminium plant. Oh, this and is something new. <laughs> I was, I was uh, about 18 months, I was a production engineer on the shop floor, literally producing uh, rolls of aluminium foil. And the end use of which was uh, ranging from cigarette, cigarette the wrappers inside, or the, the foil yeah. inside the cigarettes, to on the way to Tetra Pak and so on and so forth. So that's how I started my career. Went on, did my MBA from SPJ, and from college, I joined Urban Books, and uh, that's how that was my first sort of venture into a retail business. And uh, started off with sales and marketing. Uh, initially, on the institutional side, the B2B sales uh, initially in India and then uh, moved to London with, uh, with London itself and uh, quickly moved on to actually selling apparel and fabric to some of the biggest retailers in the world, in Europe specifically. I was in charge of sales for Europe, based in London. Uh, and that was a very fascinating experience because this was a time when India was not as popular and as uh, well known as it is now and certainly didn't have a good name when it came to doing <laughs> business. So my job was essentially to sell India first and then Arvind at that point in time. And uh, I was fortunate and uh, lucky to be able to deal with, work with some of the best retailers like from Zara and Pull&Bear with the Indicated Index Group with uh, Next and Marks and Spencer in the UK, uh, some of the top brands in Italy, including Benetton, Said, and so on and so forth, Marco Polo, Casta in Germany, and a number of quasi uh, retailers in Turkey. So those are the major countries I was working in. And uh, that was absolutely fascinating. And that's really what got me into uh, retail. And at the same time, I was fortunate to be working with some of the top retailers who were far ahead here at that point in time. And that's what really got me initiated into, into retail in its fullest sense. Oh, that sounds interesting. And this is a type of story which I personally have never heard from anyone about you. So I'll tell you one thing, we know uh, when retail happened, you have worked across various functions, various brands you have worked along with. How did it help you shape up your career as a professional in the retail industry? Uh, I think uh, first and foremost, it was looking at some of the best practices that happened uh, and the importance of trend, importance of fashion as it, it is evolving. And I think that was the first thing that uh, I really absorbed and uh, got used to. And uh, Europe has always been at the forefront when it comes to fashion and design. And the amount of uh, research and energy that went into that whole uh, part of the business was something which was a big learning for me. 
And that's something till this day, the importance of design, the importance of trend, the importance of uh, looking at what are the uh, upcoming uh, silhouettes, upcoming styles, because that's what creates a business when it comes to retail. And that's very, very important. And that was my first learning. Uh, followed by the amount of uh, discipline that comes into merchandising yeah. as a function. And that's something which again is, uh, and that's literally the art and science of the business. And that's what retail is about. And finally, the third uh, front end in terms of the store, the customer, and the whole experience that the customer gets in the store. And that's something which again, huge amount of learning from some of the best retailers in the world. So you have accumulated all these learnings from different retailers and you are applying all these learnings here at Shoppers. How did it help you to grow Shoppers Talk? Uh, Shoppers Talk, as you know, the first department store in the country, I would say uh, probably the originator of modern retail in India. I come from Indian retail and I'm really fortunate uh, to be doing the role that I am. And, uh, when I joined Shopperstop in uh, uh, just towards the end of 2020, and this was just after the first wave of COVID, and uh, as as I got into the business, obviously COVID had forced every retailer in yeah. the world to have a rethink in terms of what they're doing, what the strategy was, and we did the same. We looked at our strategy, and the strategy had been put in place. What I did do, along with my team, was to review it tweak it to uh, make sure that it is tailored for the new realities that are coming into the world and into the market and then focus on implementation and that's what we've really done and that's what's been the focus for me for the time I've tried here. So we know you must have seen that you have been the retail industry for such a long time you must have seen the consumer behavior changing and how, what have you learned from those changing consumer behaviors and how it helps you take like bold decisions here at Shoppers? Uh, the fascinating thing about retail is that the consumer, the customers, always evolving, always changing. And that's something which I think change is the only constant when it comes to uh, the customer and the consumer. But at the same time, there are things that don't change. And I think it's it's the uh, it's those two that you need to really focus on. If you look at things that have not changed, the love for the brand remains, the trust that customers have on a retailer, on a brand, continues to be very important, uh, and the, the the demand, the need, the desire for fashion, the latest trends always remains the same. What has changed, and I think again. The uh, COVID did create, uh, I mean, acted as a catalyst, if you can call it that, in terms of uh, fast forwarding the level of change. And uh, the level of uh, the customer requirement in terms of experience, customers' desire for a much more personalized experience, that's something which has changed. And the way customer shops has evolved. And uh, evolved very rapidly from moving to being uh, pretty much shopping at brick and mortar stores to looking at online as a channel to now the present where it is omni-channel and today the customer expects to be able to be in and out of the store and the app of the store or the brand seamlessly where the journey might start on the app and finish in the store or vice versa, where they might be in the store, choose a product, but finally decide to buy it while in from the comfort of their home. So uh, one thing that I've observed that you have a very fair understanding of consumer, right? And Shopper Stop focuses upon customer loyalty also. So how do you think oh, it has played a major role in gaining the consumers, winning their trust and maybe winning them forever as loyal consumers? Uh, I, I wouldn't say I have a good understanding of the consumer, I have a fair understanding, but I don't think it will ever be enough. And uh, uh, Shopper Stop and one of the foundations of the business is its uh, loyalty program. The first loyalty program, again, one of the oldest loyalty programs and 
one of the best known technology programs in the country. Uh, today we have I remember seeing four citizen lounge at Shopper's Stop when I was growing up during those days. And uh, what I can say is it's still there and it's become bigger and better. The, the personal shoppers lounge that we have is something which uh, uh, is unique to us and it gives the customer a very different experience. And it's dedicated to our uh, first citizen customers. Uh, especially the first citizen black customers and we have a first citizen black customers lunch. Uh, and the loyalty program uh, has been the bedrock of this business. Uh, every single week, anywhere between 65 to 70% of our customers are pure repeat customers. And add to that another 10 to 15 customers who have got enrolled in that week. So between 75 to 80% of our sales come from our first citizen customers oh, okay. week in, week out. And we are really fortunate and blessed that our customers choose to come back to us and bless us with their business. And this is possible only because of the uh, specific experiences that get, they get from us, the exclusive offers that we would have for our first citizen customers, combined with the whole uh, menu of uh, uh, advantages that comes in with being a first citizen uh, loyalty member. So first citizen member, when you say talk about 80% of loyal consumers is a, is a huge brand. It is. Uh, 9.2 million customers as of date. But what I would say is it's actually pure repeat is between 65 to 70%. The rest are actually new customers. So it's a healthy mix to have because as a business, it's important that we are attracting new customers and we are we are getting between uh, 30 to 35 percent of new customers every week as well. And it's important for us to be ensuring that we continue to get that so that the loyalty base expands. And hence, we have a larger pool of customers who are coming back to us week in, week out. Oh, that's nice. One more thing which I've observed by, since I've been growing, I've seen Shopper Stop has always laid emphasis on beauty equally. I mean, it's, beauty has is as a sector is growing up, category is growing up these days. Maybe thanks to COVID, a, a sport of brands came in, they taught consumers how to use what is the AM routine, what is the PM routine, how to layer up your products. But I mean, beauty has been a part and parcel of uh, shop, shop to stop since, since like starting, I guess. Yes, we have been one of the ideas uh, of beauty. Uh, pretty much from the time we started. Uh, we launched uh, MAC from the Estee Lauder Group of Companies in 2005. And ever since our business of beauty has not only been an integral part of our business, but also has continued to grow. Yeah. Today it represents about 17% of our total business. And uh, we have pure beauty standalone stores of about 89 beauty stores. And every single shopper stop store has a beauty section right at the entrance. So, yeah, a fairly large portfolio from that point of view, bringing in the best international brands and national brands in beauty. Uh, we are focused in the premium beauty space, and that's really the, uh, the segment of the market that we cater to. And we remain focused in that. And our, our aim is to continue expanding that market. And as you rightly said, in the last few years, the awareness of beauty has grown and has grown quite remarkably. And uh, this has happened because of the fact that the customer is now becoming aware of beauty. And it's still the stage at which the market is where uh, this content is becoming very crucial. And content to give customer information and to also educate the customer about beauty beauty products and how to use beauty. Makeup as a category has grown and that's something which we see evolving. Fragrance has always been quite large. Yeah. And then the third segment within beauty which is skin is still relatively small. And hence the opportunity for growth in that category is even higher. If you look at our own journey and uh, in the quarter that just went by, beauty as a business grew by 14% for us, which is quite nice, and uh, it's grown on the back of the fact that built on the foundation of our partnership with the Estee Lauder Group of uh, 
brands. So we run all the standalone boutique stores of uh, Mac, uh, ST Lauder, Clinic, Too Faced, Joe Malone, and uh, each of these are uh, catered to a different segment of the market. And of course, I forgot Bobby Brown. So that's the other brand that we have. Uh, apart from that, uh, we also launched our own beauty stores uh, called SS Beauty. Yeah. And this was, we now have 12 of them. These are standalone uh, beauty formats and uh, 2,000 square feet roughly. And the SS Beauty stores give customers an opportunity to shop in an environment which is beauty specific and only beauty. So that's the other vehicle that we see for growing our beauty business. And uh, the third area which we ventured into last year was setting up a subsidiary called Shopperstop called Global SS Beauty, which is to get into the distribution business. And we now have exclusive distribution rights to India for a few brands, Glarus uh, in the skincare space, uh, a few maintenance brands from the Maria International Division, uh, which includes Nubla, uh, Athena Cologne, Ralph, yeah. name a few and uh, we would soon be launching Nurse which uh, is an American brand from the house of Shishido and uh, it's again one of the most popular brands of the world not yet present in India and we expect to bring that now uh, into the country launch that uh, towards the early part of uh, third quarter of the financial year. But I want to understand one thing, beauty has always been a part of shop and stop strategy somehow but what was the need? Why did you felt that there's a need to open separate beauty stores? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. And uh, the uh, opportunity for expanding beauty uh, is, is fast growing now. As the awareness of the market uh, for beauty is there and also as the market itself expands. Uh, if you look at, uh, and if I just talk of the opportunity in the country, uh, the usage of beauty is still between one tenth to one twentieth of uh, even countries like uh, in the developed markets, certainly it will be around the one twentieth of what it is in the US or some of the countries in Europe. But even if you were to look at and compare to a uh, island in Malaysia, it's still way behind in terms of per capita consumption. And I'm just referring to the target segment of ours space that we operate in. So hence the opportunity for us to expand the market. At the same time, with the customer now more aware of beauty, they are also wanting to shop beauty in an environment which is beauty specific. The department stores will continue to have our beauty section, but also for us to be able to go faster and have smaller stores and hence go deeper into the market is what this is beauty does. Along with bringing in the best brands, also the experience that we can offer. And we just had uh, launched a skin advisor uh, into some of the uh, SS beauty stores. There is a virtual mirror and uh, again uh, that helps. And then we're looking at fragrance finders in beauty stores. So aided by technology, aided by having our makeup artists and these makeup artists are the are real differentiators for us in our stores because again what they do is to help the customer make choices, advise right. the customer and make choices as to what they should. And makeup has been something which we have been over emphasizing on. Uh, we did uh, in, uh, in the whole of last year, we did over 400,000 makeup in our store and that's 400,000 opportunities of engagement with our customer, which is something which can't be replicated in any other way. So will you always stick to luxury brands or do you have any brand, any plans to pour into bridge to luxury or the new age brands to get on both the new age brands as well? Uh, we are in the premium space. We are not, I wouldn't say we are way into the luxury space, but we do have a few luxury brands, or bridge to luxury brands. We are predominantly in the premium space and uh, we into in the department stores, we would also have a few brands which are in the marketing space. Uh, but our aim is to bring in the best international and a few national brands and bring them to our customers. So another thing which I have seen that is Shopper Stop is has not ever shied of betting bit on their private labels. 
what is a private label strategy and why do you think private labels are necessary when you it's a department store there are plethora of brands already available buy private brands we are a house of brands and uh, uh, that's the new what age term house, house of brands oh my god <laughs> and usually we are very retail we have uh, in our stores we have over 500 brands that we retail and on, if you add shopstore.com that goes up to almost 600 to 700 brands because we do have a few brands which are available only online so uh, truly we are a house of brands <laughs> but within that also we have uh, our own private brands and uh, what the private brands do for uh, our customer is to have some exclusive brands which are available only at shopstore and yeah. that exclusivity is what differentiates us uh, to, to a certain extent and these private brands uh, currently they are I, mean, I would say they are labels moving into brands and our aim is to create and make some of these brands really powerful in terms of how we take them forward uh, stock life Fredini are three of our power brands and each of these brands are expanding as we speak and uh, if you look at the growth that we have had, it's now close to 21% of our total apparel business. And it occupies the good segment within our stores. So we're giving, if I look at it as a good better best, for our customers, there's a choice of buying the best international brands. You've got a complete segment, you've got a number of national brands, well-known brands. And at the bottom end, you have a few private brands which are uh, bringing the latest fashion but at a price point which uh, is more affordable and that's that's the way the hierarchy gets built. So lots of brands under the same umbrella, I mean under the same roof that way. Yeah, we are a multi-category department store across apparel, beauty, watches, sunglasses, home, cookware. And Any other category you're planning to explore? Uh, jewelry is a category which we have just got into and we used to do jewelry uh, a few years back and then we had sort of uh, dialed down on it. We've just relaunched beauty and, uh, uh, sorry, we've relaunched jewelry and that's something which uh, has uh, started off being uh, currently available in five of our stores, including lab grown diamonds and that's something which has the uh, initial uh, response has been extremely encouraging. So you have been doing a lot, many things, you must be facing some challenges. What are those challenges that you are facing currently and how are you overcoming those challenges? Uh, the challenges, uh, and the first one that always comes to mind is uh, about expansion and being able to expand, find the right location. Because for a retailer like us, finding the right location is very important. And uh, closely linked to that is also, uh, we are in a number of malls, the malls getting completed on time, completed in full, and being able to launch strongly. So that's from a property perspective, that's one of the challenges that always one faces, and we have to find ways to overcome that as we go forward. The second uh, area that is uh, ever changing is uh, the way customers shop and seeing risk and staying ahead of that. Uh, we talked about the omni channel and that's that's the way retail is to it. And uh, it's staying making sure that you're staying with the customer in terms of their uh, changing needs, their changing ways of shopping and staying ahead of the customer in that journey is something which is very really crucial. And that leads to the adoption and use of digital because technology is is huge technology is large but at the same time there is a lot of it and it's really choosing which of those make a real difference which of those are the ones that would make a difference to the customer which of those would be right for us as a retailer and that's what uh, we are constantly looking at technology i mean shopper stop has been at the forefront of adopting technology what if technology someday or maybe AI replaces your job someday? What will you do? Uh, I, uh, I, mean, I think what I do, AI can do tomorrow, uh, is something which uh, uh, I would uh, 
not a bit of surprise actually. <laughs> could happen. But at the same time, I think AI, uh, as as it is evolving, and I think AI can always be a tool which will help people and humans be more productive. And that's what it will get used to. And uh, the real opportunity is to be able to use AI to improve the convenience for our customers, to improve experience for our customers, and help us to be a lot more agile and be much faster into the market. Oh yes, when we are running short on time, it's my last question to you. I want to know, under your guidance, how we plan to what 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 uh, do you foresee for Shopper's stock for next say next three years from now? Uh, I think uh, we have a clear strategy in place, and uh, executing that is something which uh, we are very very focused on. Growing our beauty business, growing experience in our stores because the future of retail is experiential and making sure that we create experiences in store that are second to none and that's what will bring people into our store and equally making sure our experience on our app is absolutely stellar so that customers can choose how they engage with us and how they interact with us so that's that's something which uh, we would we would continue to focus on and uh, the, more, the other exciting thing in our own business, the uh, growth of excess beauty stores, which we talked about, launching the new brands, many, many new beauty brands into the country. And finally, Intune, which is the new fashion for all format, which we have just launched and uh, has caught up to a good start. And growing that business is the other thing that we are looking forward to. So when you talk about the future of retail, you talked about experiential retailing is going to be a big thing that way. What else is going to take the retail industry by storm according to you? Uh, the future of retail, as is the present of retail, which will just get stronger is on each other. And that uh, is definitely something which is here to stay. The third thing which I think is yet to happen in the country, starting to happen is the importance of sustainability and as the, uh, the, the importance of it becomes uh, foremost in the minds of the customer, I think the importance of that will get a lot more evident. Uh, and uh, I think last but not the least, uh, the use of technology to reduce friction for the customer and to improve experience and convenience is something which is here to stay. And not just when it comes to the commerce side of it, but across every single part of the function. But underlying all of this, and we as a business, Shop is Talk is a business uh, which is led by people, and the importance of what people does will not change. And when we talk of all of the changes, the, the, the fact that the service that our front end colleagues do, all of the work that our people do at the back, right from design to buying to merchandising to the uh, supply chain team, the support on the backbone of the function like HR or finance, and the people who look forward in terms of expansion, in terms of projects. These are vital functions, and underlying all of this, what is now becoming even more important is the technology function, the digital teams. That will not change because that's what drives this business forward. That's where we invest a lot of our time and attention. That's where I invest a lot of my time. And that's something which is here to stay. And somehow I believe that customers' urge to have more brands here in India is going to grow. Yes, as I said, the one thing which doesn't change is the love for brands. And that will continue because that's, that's human nature and that's what people aspire for. Uh, finally, what do we do as a, as a retailer? Our purpose, the only thing that we really do is to make our customers look good and feel confident. And we do that with the aid of some of the best known brands in the world as well as some of our own brands. Oh, that's nice. Before we wrap it up, uh, we know we have a rapid chat where I will not give you time to think about any question. I will have to ask like just quickly. Not that you gave me time earlier. <laughs> <laughs> You are saying I'm rude that way. <laughs> no issues. So my first question is tell me which is your favorite business book and what did you like about that? Ah, uh, 
the the book or uh, I would say probably a set of books, but the one the, the one author which had yeah. hugely influenced with as a Peter Drucker, and uh, specifically within Peter Drucker, I think the management challenges for the twenty first century was something which I have always uh, been enamored by. More recently, I read the uh, the CEO excellence uh, from by a few consultants from McKinsey, which was also some, which has left a lasting impact. Okay, uh, if not in retail, <coughs> what you would have been doing? Hmm. Uh, I guess I would have been into some form of sports related activity, maybe a sports management. Not playing something? Uh, I, I would have loved to, and that's probably what I would have done while I would have been still young. But then as I got older, <laughs> I guess I would have had to go into something related to sport than sport itself. <laughs> one retailer or maybe the one one retail brand that you admire a lot? Uh, the brand that I admire is Massimo Dutti, and uh, the retailer that I admire is Sergio. Oh, that's great. If uh, we know that you are the MD and CEO of Shoppers Talk, we spearheading everything over here. But one thing that people don't know, what do you prefer to do in your free time? Uh, as, I, as I sort of hinted earlier, I'm a huge sports enthusiast and uh, I play badminton myself and uh, I do that over the weekends. I have a great uh, set of friends with whom I do. And uh, with the same set of friends, I also, during the weekdays, we go running. So those are the two passions we have in terms of doing. And uh, the other passion of mine is football. And I watch a lot of football. I'm a big Arsenal fan. And uh, that's something which really, if, if there's one passion outside of family and work, it's Arsenal. <laughs> My last question, one thing which you feel that other retailers or maybe other professionals in the industry should look up to you and learn from you. One, that, that one quality of yours which, in which you want to define yourself. Uh, that's, a, that's a difficult one. I think uh, I would say the ambition for growth and always looking at I mean, setting high standards and achieving them. That's what I've always believed in. That's what I always do. Inspire yourself and inspire others. Absolutely. <laughs> Dream big and do big things. It was a pleasure having you Venu, at the show today. Thank you for being a part of it. Thanks, Jarvin. Great being on your show. And uh, uh, look forward to further interactions in the future. Definitely. Thank you. Hope you also enjoyed this episode as we enjoyed shooting it and talking to each other. Looking forward to meet you next week with another retailer, another story. Till then. Bye.